Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Thank you so much. Today, I have a fantastic guest, like every week, and we're going to be discussing FTD and how it differentiates from Alzheimer's because I think there's not that much known about FTD. I know I certainly don't know enough about it, so I would like you to help me welcome Allison Schreier. She also is the founder of Zinnia TV, which we'll talk about at the end. So thanks for joining me, Allison. My pleasure. So why don't you give us your background? Um, it was your hubby that had FTD. So tell us how you got drop kicked into caregiving. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah. So my husband was um, in his early 40s when he decided he was making some decisions that were sort of odd um, decisions that would affect the whole family, but that he um, would not discuss with the whole family. So our kids were quite small at that time. I mean, and, and when he was 40, um, our kids were uh, were very young and uh, decisions like I'm going to leave, leave my job as a software engineer at Microsoft and go to graduate school. Uh, you are? <laughs> wow. <laughs> what will we be doing for an income exactly? Because I'm at home with little kids. But anyway, yeah, that's, a, that's a big life change. Uh, it is. And but he really struggled. He was in a Ph.D. program at the University of Washington for computer science. And he just and he really struggled. He just couldn't get through it. And then eventually in 2006, he pulled the plug and decided that he would stop. Um, and it took him about a year to get a job, which was sort of odd because he was kind of a rock star when he was at Microsoft. He was very, very good at what he did, but he wasn't coming across very well in interviews. But he finally did get a job, and it was a dream job for him, working in a company that was doing some cutting edge stuff with game design, and he was a big computer gamer. Um, but within a year, they, um, they fired him. Oh, and no. they said that he just never seemed to catch fire. That was the language that they used. So at this point, he was probably around 46 um, or so. And he had noticed as the year was progressing that he was no longer being invited to important meetings. There were a couple of times when he came home and he shared that he had made egregious mistakes. And he was, mm. he was so upset. He said, I'm making mistakes that are like that a junior programmer would make and you would fire them because they're hopeless. Like nobody makes mistakes like these. And I can't figure out why I'm making these mistakes. And then he had a project that was due that he needed to use a certain type of programming that he hasn't used in a long time. And I said, well, how do you figure it out? And he said, I don't know. And I was like, but do you look it up on the internet? I mean, like, what, what are the steps you would take? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to figure out what I don't know. Ooh. So while at home, what I was seeing is that he had just started, he had become disengaged. He just wasn't very involved in family activities. He was um, obsessive about certain things. He had uh, started playing a game, a card game called Magic the Gathering, and he was obsessive. Uh, at one point, I discovered that he was spending $400 a week on mm. Magic the Gathering cards, and he was buying lots and lots of um, wine. I, cases and cases of wine were showing up at the door, and I was like, what are we? We don't drink that much wine. <laughs> we uh, starting a winery here? <laughs> yeah, so it, it all it all just no, nothing made sense. And he was uh, no no longer helping with things around the house. I, I, I stopped leaving him alone with the kids because I would, uh, for instance, come home and find that he was sitting on the sofa with them at night. Like I would go to book club and I might not get back until 10 o'clock. Kids have school the next day. They at this point were like 10 and, and 12. And I would find him sitting on the living room sofa with them watching porn. <gasps> so, right. So things like that that are like, wow, who are you? What is going on here? So I will share that when he when he could no longer complete, his, uh, make things happen in graduate school, he decided that something was wrong. He was he was feeling depressed. So he saw a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said that he was struggling with depression 
and that he had what she called adult onset ADHD, because one of his complaints was, you know, the reason I'm not able to make it through graduate school is I just can't seem to stay focused on anything. Like I can't complete a task. And I have found the same thing true at home, like ask him to do a chore. And I would come in, and I'd be like, whoa, wow. Like he couldn't even wipe the counter, right? He'd take a sponge oh. and he would take one swipe and then he'd walk away and I'd be like, there are crumbs everywhere. What are you doing? So anyway, I mean, that's easy to understand how that would be misdiagnosed as ADHD. Yeah. Although adult onset. Right. And she said, mm-hmm. well, what it is, you see, is that you probably always had ADHD, but you were so high functioning that you were able to mask it. And so armed with that diagnosis, he then started seeing a therapist and then another therapist and another therapist. He when he got fired from that job, which was very, very devastating, he decided to, we we decided together, like, okay, so this adult ADHD thing, like there's something else going on. So he got neuropsych, a uh, complete neuropsych workup and he got a, um, and he had an MRI. The MRI showed that um, according to the, the guy who, the neurologist who read the MRI, he my husband was so offended that he, the neurologist came out and clapped him on the shoulder. And he said, well, my pal, all I can say is sucks to be you. I don't know what's going on, but your brain is fine. So it's not oh, about no. your brain. I will share oh, with terrible you. bedside manner. Yes. So I will share with you that when we shared that same MRI a few years later with some, some dementia specialists in San Francisco, they looked at it at the university of California. They looked at that same MRI and they were just like, man, like it says FTD all over it, but the neurologist didn't see it. And I, I believe that it is because people who aren't trained to look for dementia are looking for something that is there that shouldn't be like a mass, a tumor, Mm -hmm. whereas a regular, um, Whereas a dementia neurologist is looking for something maybe that isn't there that should be, you know, because the brain, of course, loses mass over time with dementia. And the neuropsych workup that he had at that time was uh, was odd. There were huge disparities in the things that he could do and the things that he couldn't do, which for somebody of his level of education and function shouldn't have been the case. Anyway, long story short, Uh, In 2012, when he was 48 years old and our kids were 12 and 15 at that point, I started seeing a therapist because I was like, (laughs) okay, I don't know if I can stay married to this guy. I mean, it's just getting worse and worse. He's become so distant. He's become um, completely disengaged from me and the kids and just doing things that make absolutely no sense. And then when I bring them to his attention, he gets angry at me and pins it on me. You know, I remember at one point that um, he he um, uh, he accused me of being over functioning like you over function. And I said, I over function because you under function. I mean, like, who's going to do all the stuff that you're not doing? But anyway, so I started seeing a therapist and I said, I really want to save my marriage, but I, I don't know how. And after a few months of seeing her, um, and by the way, at the same time, my husband and I together were seeing a marriage counselor who specialized in couples where one or the other has ADHD. And I would bring up things in the meetings with this guy and I'd be like, OK, so let me just share this thing that happened. And I would tell him some outrageous thing that my husband did. And he would say, well, you know, the person with ADHD, we need to really respect who they are and where they are. And I'm like, I but don't you understand? I mean, do, is this ADHD like this behavior? I know a lot of people with ADHD and none of them are watching porn with their kids, right? Like something else is going on here. And yeah, that so doesn't I, sound like a typical ADHD thing. My son-in-law has ADHD and I think my husband also has ADHD and my daughter thinks she might have a little bit of ADHD. So it's like, I yeah. was just actually asked recently, um, they were looking for women that had ADHD and this person reached out like, do you have ADHD? I'm like, no, tiny bit of OCD slash control freak, but no, o- no ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> and control freak is definitely a uh, inherited trait. <laughs> I, I totally understand that one. <laughs> Caregivers anyway, end so, up being control freaks too. Say that again. Caregivers end up being control freaks too. Well, until we learn that we that it's not going to get us very far. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, but anyway, just to wrap up that story, the um, the therapist who I was seeing 
eventually one day we had what I would refer to as a whiteboard moment where I just laid out a bunch of things that had happened in the past week since I'd last seen her. And she just shook her head and she said, okay, that is not ADHD. Like, whoa. So she put me in touch with a psychiatrist who I met with my husband. We had a session with her. She called me at home and she said, I need to have a session just with you. Mm. And so I went in and I met with her and she said, okay, so there's something very wrong with your husband's brain. And she said, we need to start going through a list of um, things that we rule out. And so we, we had, we created a list and uh, like rule out a vitamin B deficiency, um, rule out sleep issues, rule out. And so going through all of these things that we were ruling out. And then at the very bottom was frontotemporal dementia. And so when we had gotten through the entire list, and it turns out that he did have horrible sleep apnea, which I believe contributed to his decline. And we could talk about that as much as you want to, because it's something that I've learned a lot about. Um, but anyway, um, when we got down to the last thing on the list, and I was in touch with her constantly, and she said, okay, so now, now we get a PET scan. And once you get a PET scan... Um, that is when we will know for sure whether or not it's FTD. And, and what I know now is that the typical the typical course, so first of all, I'm going to say that a problem when somebody has a behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia, because there are two different flavors of FTD, there is the behavioral variant, and then there's something called primary progressive aphasia. The behavioral variant, the typical thing that happens is that doctors will look at um, six possible symptoms. Now that's if you're working with a person who understands what FTD is, but a lot of people who are living uh, with a person with FTD don't see it as a neurological issue because the person is young. Like you don't think dementia, they don't have memory issues. So you don't think dementia. And so what do you think? You think mental health issue. So maybe, so you start with a therapist and therapists are not, I have discovered, um, necessarily well-versed on symptoms that point to FTD. So the way that an FTD diagnosis should happen is that doctors look at six different symptoms. The first symptom being disinhibition. So a person with, uh, so for example, the way that my husband presented these things is that he would meet somebody who he didn't, somebody who he doesn't know, and he would look at them and he would say, why are you so fat? <gasps> oh, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> for instance, you know, or ask, I remember we went to a restaurant um, and the gal who was the hostess was somebody who clear, she was, she was a heavy lady. Um, she was definitely not pregnant, right? She was definitely just, she was definitely heavy, but my husband asked her when she was due. And we all know that you never <laughs> ask somebody a question like that. Um, anyway, uh, or he would tell, he would be t looking at somebody, talking to them and he would say, you know, I really don't like you. Just, wow. Um, <laughs> or things like um, I took the kids and my husband to a park where they were doing an outdoor movie. And so it's all parents and they're young kids. The, so my kids were probably like 11 and 13 at the time or something. And so we're at this family movie and everybody's sitting in their little chairs on their blankets, eating their picnic food. And my son, my younger son, leans over to me and he goes, mom, mom, no. And I look over and my husband is masturbating. Like, oh no. At the movie, right? Okay, so that's what we're talking about. <laughs> like Jeez. what? Okay, so, so disinhibition is number one. Number two is apathy or, or inertia. So a loss of interest in things that were once very important. So for my husband, for instance, he was mad about mountain biking and hiking and um, water, like, you know, kayaking. And he just slowly over time just sort of lost interest in all of those things, which just seemed so unusual. Another thing is loss of sympathy or empathy. And um, people with FTD have a really hard time seeing things from another person's perspective. So for instance, I remember when my younger son, my poor younger son, when my younger son um, walked up to my husband and he, and he wrapped his arms around him and he hugged him and he said, I love you, dad. And my husband just stood there and I said, Evan, Evan, tell Eli that you love him. And Evan said, but I don't love him. <laughs> I think okay. it's your son probably had some therapy after all this. 
Yes. <laughs> well, yes, he has. Um, <laughs> and so that loss of sympathy and empathy is the, is the third of these symptoms that I'm talking about. The fourth one is perseveration or compulsion. So that um, just like there are things that they suddenly lose interest in, there are things that they just can't get enough of. So for instance, my husband with the Magic the Gathering, the game, game right? Suddenly just buying Magic the Gathering cards, couldn't get enough of those cards. I remember when uh, he told me that he had stopped buying them because I was like, you've got to stop buying the cards. Like you cannot buy the cards anymore. And he said, I stopped, I stopped. I don't buy the cards anymore. And then I was in his car and there was a, a letter that had just been opened up that like, you know, he'd picked up the mail and he opened a letter and the letter was sitting there and I read it and it was from the guy he was buying cards from thanking him for being the best customer he'd ever had <laughs> because he was buying so many cards. Um, and so this perseveration or compulsion, it could be that there are movements that they do. It could be that there is an adoption of rituals or something that they say over and over and over again. Um, and with my husband, another thing, he'd always liked computer games, but he became manic. He, he playing computer games. I remember going into his office and say, telling him there was a problem with some water running across our driveway. It was a hill and it was cold out and it was freezing. And I said, we have got to go figure out where that water is coming from. We need to get out there with shovels. We need to figure out what the problem is. Cars are going to slide off the driveway. Someone's going to get hurt. And he looked over his shoulder at me. He was playing his computer games and he said, I'm busy. He just kept playing computer games, you know, and you're like, why I oughta, right? why won't you help me? So you're lucky so that... you didn't hit him over the head with the shovel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Is it common for FTD to start in people that young? Because, like I said, I really don't know that much about FTD. Yeah. So FTD um, is generally younger people, but not always. So when we see a dementia that is starting in like the 40s or 50s, um, it is more often than not going to be a frontal lobe dementia, more often than not frontotemporal dementia. So there are um, certainly people who get young onset Alzheimer's disease. There are certainly people who get young onset vascular or Lewy body dementia. But generally, it's go if it's a younger person, it's most likely going to be a frontotemporal dementia. And that's just some random disease like Alzheimer's. They have no idea what causes it. Well, so that's a great question. Um, so of the three, so there are four main dementias, right? So Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, and, and frontotemporal dementia. And so Alzheimer's far and away is the one that most people have, right? 70% of people with, with a dementia have Alzheimer's disease. Lewy body would be, a, would be second, but far fewer people have Lewy body than Alzheimer's. Third is probably FTD, and then vascular fits in there somewhere. There are probably fewer than 200,000 people in the United States who have FTD, but you know there are almost 7 million people in the United States with dementia. So therefore, even though FTD ranks pretty high in the dementias, it is a rare disease. And um, so, so what is it? So the, of those three, so Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body disease, and frontotemporal dementia, all three of those are, um, as much as we know, are caused by proteins, basically, that are doing things that they're not supposed to do in the brain. And it's a different mechanism for each of those three diseases. They also affect different parts of the brain. So the, the way that you will behave from your dementia is going to be different depending on what dementia you have, because that is what dictates what parts of the brain are affected. So with Alzheimer's disease, for instance, it is the, um, the temporal lobes and the hippocampus that are affected. And so that will affect language and it will affect um, memory and wayfinding. So the hippocampus is memory and wayfinding. Um, Lewy body dementia has to do with uh, the occipital lobe and the parietal lobes. And so that has to do with vision and with movement. And so therefore, people with Lewy body dementia are most likely to get um, um, hallucinations because of that in the stuff that's going on with the occipital lobe. And they tend to start getting kind of a shuffly gait. People with frontotemporal dementia, it is the, um, the frontal and the temporal lobes. So I had mentioned that there is the behavioral variant, which my husband had, but there's also something called primary progressive aphasia, which first affects language for that's people. That's what Bruce Willis has. Yes. 
got to keep track of all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm still working and, on my honorary PhD in dementia knowledge here. <laughs> oh, keep going, girl. But yeah, and so the question of like, so how do how do people get get that? Well, we don't know. Um, what we do know is that probably three percent of people who currently have Alzheimer's disease have something that had to do with genetics where probably for people with FTD, it's more than like 20 to 30% Ooh. has something to do with genetics. So, um, and so we do know what some genetic markers are for FTD, just like we know what some genetic markers are for Lewy body dementia or Alzheimer's disease. That's, that's yeah. interesting. I thought vascular was number two. I guess you know, just... vascular. Oh, go ahead. I want to say it. I think they shuffle around. But I thought, yeah, I thought vascular was number two. We're discovering more all the time. You know, I think that what for the three that have to do with like protein stuff going wrong would be Alzheimer's, Lewy body and, and frontotemporal dementia. Vascular disease is a completely different animal, right? Because it has to do with an unhealthy cardiovascular system. Um, so um, vascular dementia is often uh, part of mixed dementias. So a lot of people will have, for instance, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia or Lewy body and vascular dementia. So I do think that a lot of people um, that vascular dementia rates are both um, high and it is probably the one that is most avoidable, right? Because if we mm -hmm. can avoid the stuff that would cause coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis and all of that stuff, then we're going to see fewer cases of um, vascular dementia. I think my maternal grandmother had mixed dementias because she had a brain aneurysm that leaked for three months. And any place the blood touches the brain is just tragic oh. for the brain. But her progression was much more like Alzheimer's. And I've had people tell me vascular doesn't progress like Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's doesn't, isn't caused from a brain aneurysm. So, you know, my side chair arm diagnosis is, uh, is that she had mixed. And then I don't know how many people remember this, but my maternal great grandmother also had dementia. So mm -hmm. I might get the blood test for the, the biomarkers, but I don't have any concerns. I do everything for brain health. It's like just part of my daily life is brain health. <laughs> Well, yay you, and yeah. that's what we need, what we all should be doing. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not that hard once you know you start incorporating healthier lifestyle choices. And um, at the beginning of this year, twenty twenty four, I started eating a lot more vegetarian um, because I was told I had um, the issue with my throat was silent reflux, which basically the acids form a gas and irritate your vocal cords. None of the fixes have fixed it so far. I have another appointment with an ENT doctor, um, but I lost a bunch of weight going on more, you know, having about two thirds of my meals be vegetarian. And it's difficult to explain, but I feel better and different. And even though I ate really lean meat and, you know, not a lot of meat, it's interesting. So it's like, there's definitely a tie-in. And you were mentioning that your husband had significant sleep apnea and that you were, you're very convinced that that, made things worse, which I agree with. I have a friend who had high-ish blood pressure, high enough to be a problem, but not like super worrisome. And he went on a CPAP machine and his blood pressure went back to normal. That was well, the I, only change. Yep. I was just having this conversation today with my, uh, with my dentist of all people. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think this is something that's so important for people to be aware of. So we, during this workup with my husband, we did discover that he had terrible sleep apnea. Now, when I first met him, he was a guy who had recently bought a Ford Explorer because it was the only car big enough for him to be able to take a nap in the middle of the day in the parking hmm. garage at Microsoft. And um, because he he was tired all the time. So that's a symptom, right? However, he didn't snore, he didn't gasp for breath, and he wasn't overweight. So we never thought of it as a sleep issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. We just thought of it as that he was maybe kind of a low energy guy, which fit with his family profile. His mom was kind of a low energy person. So, okay, maybe that's all it is. I believe that all along he had sleep apnea. And I recently decided that I would get baseline tested myself. I'm not overweight. I don't gasp for breath. I don't have um, any kind of uh, 
I, I don't snore generally. Um, and I'm generally pretty high energy. Well, gosh, if I don't have sleep apnea, it turns out that when I'm lying on my back, that I have 20 episodes per hour where I am lifting out of the sleep that is needed for my brain to be able to stay healthy. So that's wow. bad, right? Yeah, 20 an hour is a lot. Well, it's not actually considered crazy, right? It's considered like something that you should do something about. My husband's was far worse. Hmm, that's interesting. Never getting into the kind of sleep that he needs for his brain to clean itself out. And it depends on, uh, so, so mine is dependent on how I'm sleeping. If I'm on my back, that's the case. If I'm on my side, I don't do that. And so there are a couple of fixes. And one of them is to either, like the easiest thing, take your sleep in a t-shirt and then rubber band a tennis ball into your t-shirt so that when you roll over, you don't roll over. But there are also people, there's like these special sleep backpacks you can wear so that you roll, <laughs> there's a thing that you can wear so that it buzzes when you start to go onto your back. So one solution is, well, then don't sleep on your back. Another solution, and the one that I have chosen, is that I am picking up, it's, it's ready, I just got a notice from the, <laughs> from the TMJ people, that I'm going to be getting a mandibular device jaw, for my jaw that causes my jaw, because the problem, of course, when I'm on my back, is that my jaw, when I'm fully relaxed, slides back and blocks off my airway. So the fix is don't do that. Get something that prevents your jaw from going backwards. And so I'm going to do that. That is the step that one could take prior to trying a CPAP machine. And according to my sleep folks, my apnea is not bad enough um, to merit the use of a CPAP machine, especially since it only happens when I'm on my back. So we're gonna try this jaw device instead. And, and add it to my regimen, is something that I didn't even know existed. And it's sort of like a creepy thing to talk about, but they have these things that go in your nostrils that open up your airway. They're called nasal dilators and mm. they're really unobtrusive and you pop it in and they come in nice colors. Um, you pop it in. So you look super hot, right? If <laughs> you're like, at least it's got a nice color. Like nose while... gauges. <laughs> <laughs> so that while you're in bed, it opens up your airways so that you breathe better. So Ooh. anyway, I am just sold on the idea that everybody should be exploring just how good is your sleep. And I will tell you that I wear an Apple Watch. I Me used too. to wear an Aura <laughs> Ring. And I check it every day. And I'm like, oh, cool. I only woke up, you know, four times last night. And I wasn't, and I don't even remember, right? I wasn't awake very long. I woke up and I fell back to sleep. It doesn't show you that you're having apnea events. So you cannot use an Apple Watch as a metric for whether or not you have apnea. Now, there are apps that they recommend you use that will capture your snoring. Because mm. if you're snoring, then that's an indication that maybe you do have apnea. But for me, because I don't snore, wouldn't have that wouldn't have sent me running to the doctor. The thing that sent me running to the doctor was curiosity and a real... Um, paranoia frankly about my about the health of my brain so, so you didn't feel like there was anything wrong you were just curious and paranoid so there was there was here was another data point is that i was having um i would wake up and i would feel um like my legs really wanted to move and um so people have i thought my god maybe i have restless leg syndrome maybe i should get that checked out well, I also learned that if you do have restless legs, that it could be an indication that you're low in iron. Mm. And I was really low in iron because I had, this goes like deep into my whole hypochondria, but <laughs> I was low in iron because I had started, I donate blood and I was donating blood on a very regular basis. I was donating blood far too often for a person of my size. And so I caused my iron to go off the charts low. All because you're doing a good thing. Well, yeah, that's a whole other story about the whole iron thing. But anyway, that is actually the catalyst. I thought, you know, I've been interested in finding out if I have sleep apnea anyway. And now I've got this leg thing. Like, I want to find out what's going on with my sleep. I did um, replenish my iron and I don't have the leg thing anymore. Like, that's gone. Well, that's a, well, at I, least that was a reasonably easy fix. Well, and you know, with that, with taking the iron and now I don't have the leg thing anymore, 
when the doctor called me, it was like two months after I did the sleep study that she called me. And by then I was sleeping what felt to me like fine because my leg thing wasn't happening. So she called me up to tell me my results. And I was like, yeah, I know you, you didn't find anything wrong because I already fixed it. I started taking iron. She was like, oh, no, no, actually, there is something wrong. What? Yeah, apnea. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I don't wear my Apple Watch to bed. I, I put it on its charger and usually I put it on when I do my workout. So like I don't even uh -huh. wear it okay. the very first thing in the morning. But I could I could charge it while I'm watching TV and then wear it one night and see um, if I wake up more often than I'm aware of. I My issue is... I've been waking up at like five o'clock. I would like to get up between six and six thirty. Six thirty being the latest. My body naturally would like to just get up at seven, but you know, there are too many things to do. A little extra time is not a bad thing. And I wake up at five, and then it's like by the time I go back to sleep, because you've already slept most of the night, then it's almost six o'clock, and it's like, oh, yeah. It was. I think it was yesterday. I woke up at like. 547 i'm like oh the hell with it i'm not even gonna try to go back to sleep i'm just gonna get up which worked mm -hmm. fine but i'm now i'm curious but hmm i'll have to think on that one i don't have Thanks. a general physician's appointment for a while <laughs> go get it girl Check you know yourself. how hard it is to get in with them it's like oh you call in march and you get an end of the july appointment <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah. well, after he was diagnosed so i did not know that ftd was um that it affected younger adults that's well i'm past that point i think i'm at 57 <laughs> getting closer to the to when the alzheimer's could kick in um what what did they do for him what did they suggest you do because at this point i can't imagine living with that that sounds just very difficult yeah, much worse than alzheimer's it's it's pretty challenging and um and if somebody, uh, it, it, my husband, um, not unlike others with FTD did also start to develop, um, motor neuron disease or ALS. Mm, um, geez. and so he, he eventually became very contracted and he lost use of his hands. Um, so, and that hastens the, um, course of the disease, right? So he lived for seven years after his diagnosis, which is actually on the long side for people who have FTD with motor neuron disease. So anyway, so what did they do? Well, uh, once we had a diagnosis, which by the way, was delivered like this. <laughs> we raised myself. <laughs> yeah, the neurologist uh, came into the office where we were sitting to give us the results of the uh, PET scan. And he had a little, he had a piece of paper with him. It was a printout from the internet and he handed it to me and he looked at me. He didn't even look at my husband, maybe like sideways glances. And he said, I'm really sorry, but your husband has something called Pick's disease, which is sort of an archaic name for frontotemporal dementia. I'm sorry, but your husband has Pick's disease. Really? I'm so, so sorry. Um, this will tell you more about it. Um, I, good luck. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was good it. I'll leave you some time to collect yourselves okay, what's your name again? I mean, it was just like gone. And, um, and that was it. That was it. So we went home with that information and I had to break the news to the kids because the kids knew there was something very wrong with dad. Um, they had no, I had not shared with everybody. Well, it's either this or this or this or this or this or so sorry, frontotemporal dementia. I had not shared that. So when we got home, the kids were like, they're waiting for us. And they're like, what is it? What is it? What is it? And so I had them sit down and I told them that it is a disease that's going to continue getting worse over time and um, that there's not a cure for it. And everybody cried and the kids missed school for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, but at that time, oh, it's such a it's such a bad story. Um, we had. So bear in mind, my husband had been in and out of work, right, for a long time and. Um, and I knew that there was something very wrong and I knew that he was never going to work again. These were the things I, at least I knew this, right? He's never going to work again, whatever it is that's going on. <clears throat> I'm going to have to get a job. So at that time, our kids were in a small private school because one of my kids is on the, is a spectrum guy. 
And I was afraid that he would be eaten alive in the conventional <laughs> middle school. So they were in a private school. And I realized like, you know what? I have no idea what our financial outlook is. If my husband is never going to work again, I have not worked outside of the home for years. So now and nobody's going to hire me. I worked, I had a great job, but nobody's going to hire me again to be like a technology person because my technology experience is now 15 years old. Like I'm obsolete. Yeah, it's like so that's an antique. My, <laughs> exactly. I am an antique. So I, I didn't know what I would need to do for a job. Our house was located a beautiful piece of land. I'm just giving you all these data points, but beautiful piece of property on 10 acres at the end of a dead end road in a horrible school district. And so I thought, okay, so let's see. My kids cannot go to those schools. They need to go to, but they're, and they can't go to private school because I don't know if I can afford it. I'm gonna have to pull them out of the private school. I'm going to have to move them into public school. We're gonna to need to move out of that piece of property because they can't go to the public schools that I want them to go to if we live there. So for them to go to schools, because we can't afford private school, we're going to need to move. But my husband didn't want to move. He of course not. not to move. Um, and he had a dog that he loved. And the dog was a little stray that showed up at our house one day who was a pit bull. And oh, when dear. she showed up, I was like, I remember so, so vividly thinking, this is a terrible idea. But we took this dog in and my husband fell in love with her. And I love pit bulls, but apartment don't necessarily love pit bulls. And my solution was that I would move the, with the kids to an apartment in a good school district. And every weekend we would go to the house and be with my husband. And so that's what we did. Every night, my husband came down and ate dinner with us at the apartment. And then we would go to that to the house on the weekends that way. So my kids were starting a new school and they were in that school. Uh, they'd been in that new school district um, for a half a year when we got my husband's uh, diagnosis. And so then, and the other, so the other thing was, I thought, and if I'm gonna have to get a job, I'm gonna need to be in a place where not just are the kids in a different school, but they need to be able to walk to school and back because I'm gonna need to have a job. Or I guess they could have taken the school bus, but I was thinking that I wanted them close to the school. So in all of, if you look at all of the lists of, of the things that are terrible things that could happen to you, like you lose a job, bad thing. You move to a new community, bad thing. You get a terrible disease, bad thing. For my poor kids, it's like, bam, bam, bam. So it was, it was, it was pretty, it was a pretty rough going. Um, yeah, you kind of maxed out on the top five stressors of life. We did, we did. It was, uh, it was a hellacious time to say the least. Um, yeah, but anyway, we, but my husband did wind up moving with us to the apartment. I found somebody else. I found somebody to take the dog and my husband moved with us to the apartment because by this time we'd gone through the list with the doctor and we were approaching time to get a PET scan. And I was like, you know what? I know what he has now. I know that this is what we're going to discover. And I don't want him living by himself in the house. When we get this news, we need to be together as a family. And so I came up with some cockamamie reason why he needed to move into the apartment with us. And so we were all together when we got the diagnosis. Thankfully, I have um, very well connected friends. And so I was able to reach out through them to find him an excellent doctor in Seattle. We were immediately welcomed into a program at the University of California, San Francisco, that has a phenomenal research group doing work on FTD. And so we started going there for two years. We went there every six months, but then airplane, airplane travel wasn't gonna work for us anymore. So for two years, we went there every six months and did all kinds of testing, including genetic testing, which showed that my husband did not, as far as we know, have a genetic form. So the bad news, right, 20 to 30% genetic, which means that 70 to 80% isn't. So really the odds are in your favor that it won't be. So his doesn't seem to have been a genetic form. Um, and so, yeah, for the next couple of years, we we stayed at home as long as we, I, I did wind up buying a house. Um, we sold the house that we had lived in. I bought a house right near the school that my kids were attending. And my husband and the kids and I all lived in this house. Um, but within, I don't know, a year and a half of moving into that house, my husband's behaviors just were 
so outrageous that it really wasn't okay for him to be around the kids. The kids were just, the kids were getting destroyed. And he and I both agreed that the most important thing was to keep the kids safe. Um, and frankly, he was sick of the kids at that point. He was like, I'm oh, no. the kids. The kids drive me crazy. They're always touching my stuff. And he would go, you know, he would like start screaming, ah, because things weren't working the way he wanted them to work. And anyway, Oof. so he wound up um moving to long-term care, which he was which he was happy to do because he didn't want to live with us anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> That's yeah. kind of an an odd, um, like side effect, I guess. I yeah. mean, my mom, my mom was just adamant. She wanted to live in her home. She didn't want to be a burden. She wanted to live in her home. It was like those are mutually exclusive, honey. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. And so I had to make the tough choice to move her to memory care because my dad died not long after my fiftieth birthday. He died a month after my daughter moved out. I had been mentally preparing for empty nest and I wasn't about ready to have my mom move in. And that wouldn't have worked. And my mom thrived in memory care. She had friends. She was much younger That's than most great. of the residents. Yeah. So she always offered to help them. So she kind of had a little bit of a purpose, oh, at least for the first great. 18 months or so. Yeah. Um, first 18 months, she had her, her big fat poodle with her. Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just, you know, a lot of people, they don't realize, I mean, yes, it's expensive and I think we need a lot more options, but it's not as bad as, as it can be. And I did not do any research. I knew the memory care that was um, literally, literally a mile down the hill from my house was a no. Um, it was very dark and it was very gloomy and just no. And so when I found this other place, and they said my mom could keep her dog. It was like, here's money. Take, take my money. <laughs> like, how much money do you want? Because yeah. my dogs hated my mom's dog. Like oh, the no. dog that would not get more than a foot away from me. She would walk in the door and he'd be like, oh, hell no. And he'd go outside until she left. Oh. And he would never. I mean, at the end of his life, he had really bad nerve arthritis in his back legs. And I would get up from watching TV in the evening and use the bathroom. And he'd like lift himself up. I'm like, no, 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 I'm coming back. It like literally be like less than a minute. Just chill, dog. Just stay. Just stay. Nope. He had to follow me into the bathroom. That's a golden <laughs> retriever for you. And so for him to basically nope out and go hang out in the yard, <laughs> I was like, there's no way I can have these two come live in my house. It just my mom instinctively knew that she was still mom, even though she didn't recognize me as her daughter. That was sort of a brain twister that was hard to to, you know, cope with. I just knew it wouldn't work. I'm like, at the end of a week, one or both of us will be dead. So it's kind of interesting to hear that he was like, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go move to long term care, <laughs> which Seriously. is probably the best place for him. Yeah. Yeah, that is insane. <laughs> so I'm hoping. So this has been what we've had, like another dozen years or tech decade or so. Do you think that they have more knowledge and more awareness of FTD? I mean, that's the whole point of our conversation today. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that like they do um, with with all dementias, I think that we know more than we did 10 or 15 years ago. Absolutely. Are we closer to a cure? No. Well, Are we closer to solutions that maybe help slow down progression? Yes. Not necessarily with FTD, but certainly with Alzheimer's disease. But once you start working on one and you make some headway, it helps make headway for other diseases, too. Um, I think that there's a lot of evidence that we'll be looking at targeted solutions, kind of like we do with cancer, where there are very sort of custom solutions that are in place. So um, I'm hopeful that, first of all, I'm hopeful that neither of my children um get this disease. And I, and there's no reason for me to think that they will. Um, but I want there to be a cure in place before they get a whole lot older, right? Just in case. I don't, I would hate to have them go through this. So I think Where that are they are in their late 20s now. Uh, yeah, mid to late 20s. Okay. There are so many really smart people working on these problems. Um, and I think that there is a lot of attention being paid right now to looking for um, a, a, looking for ways to um, at, at least slow things down. So I'm, I guess, optimistic. Oh, optimism is good. 
So the lifestyle changes they suggest to slow the progression of Alzheimer's don't necessarily help with FTD. Is that what you're saying? It would help with FTD. The, the lifestyle changes that are suggested for um, Alzheimer's disease would be across the board. I, I think that they would help with um, because your your body is healthier. You know, if we're getting lots, of, if we're getting, being curious and novel, and we're getting education, well, then we're building more neurons, so we have more that we can afford to lose. I think that, you know, doing the mind diet, gets, getting lots of exercise that, you know, the list, which I know you're well aware of and that you and that you live is an important one. But it's not just for dementia, right? It's for heart disease and diabetes and cancer. So um, yeah, I, think I started my healthy, healthier lifestyle because I was severely overweight, over 200 pounds, over 250. And I'm five foot eh, three on a good day. So that's that's not a good place to be. And we ate healthy, but it's it's how you're you know, every, like everybody's brains are different. Everybody's bodies process food different. I will win the famine. So, you know, just just let you know that um, unless all the meat dies. I don't like fish. So that might, that might be the only saving grace. because my body stores fat just like if I walk by a steak. <laughs> um, but I had a photography client who was a doctor and she said, oh my gosh, you have a family history of diabetes. You are overweight. You're screwed, which is the word she used. And that fired up my little competitive squirrel brain. And I, I remember very clearly thinking, I'll show you, which I've never seen her since. And that started a very long journey to figure out how to be healthier. And I got healthier. And then I realized, oh, not only did I probably prevent getting diabetes thank god um because i do like my sweets but it also has helped protect my brain from possible alzheimer's so absolutely right. for me yep i agree <laughs> that's awesome so allison didn't think she had 45 minutes to talk about this and we're at 46 minutes oh so i'm going to give you five minutes to tell me as much as you can about zinnia tv since you are the founder of that we'll have to sure. do an episode on that sometime down the road <laughs> Absolutely. I'd love to. But just to give you a really quick overview, um, Zinnia it was, is one of the things that I did in response to my life as a dementia family caregiver. So dementia family caregivers are six times more likely to get dementia themselves because of the stress uh, that comes with being a family caregiver. And so um, Zinnia TV is a solution to try and reduce stress for both the person giving and receiving care. So Zinnia is an app that delivers a library of videos that have been custom curated to be digestible by and engaging for a person whose brain is no longer able to necessarily track a plot or tell fact from fiction or process rapidly moving audio and video. Zinnia TV came about because my husband had moved into long-term care where he was often in front of a television and it was really evident based on his responses and reactions that regular TV wasn't working for him anymore. And yet for a lot of dementia family caregivers, it's kind of a lifeline like, oh my God, I'm just going to turn on the TV for a little while to just give myself a break. And so I thought, you know what, if we're going to turn on the TV to give ourselves a break, don't we want people watching something that actually is engaging for them, like that they can actually process and enjoy and pay attention to? And so that was the thing that motivated my um, decision to move forward and start this company. And we've we've done great. We just finished two years of research with the University of British Columbia and Vancouver General Hospital. And so what we have discovered is that in addition to being entertaining, that our videos also help absolutely reduce anxiety and agitation for the person who's living with dementia. We have videos that specifically help people um, want to participate in activities of daily living. And we have mm. videos that are intended to be soothing and bring ease and joy. A recent survey with our subscription, with those who subscribe, um, uh, the survey results indicated that 80% of, of the caregivers who subscribe to Zinnia TV report that watching it with their loved one reduces their own stress. Hmm. 
So, um, yeah, so I'm feeling really positive about it, really excited about it. Uh, anybody who wants to know more can look at our website. It's zinniatv.com. That's Z-I-N-N-I-A TV.com, like the flower, the zinnia flower. And it's named after the zinnia flower because I'm a gardener and zinnias have always impressed me with how well they do, even when you plant them in horrible conditions. <laughs> <laughs> so... Zinnia is about helping people thrive beyond their diagnosis. That's awesome. And it was also less than five minutes. So that's Yay. perfect. Uh -huh. And everybody that listens regularly knows that I love to feature caregivers turned creators. And if anybody needed a solution like Zinnia TV, it was definitely you. So the website for Zinnia will be in the show notes. Like you guys know, you could check it out. Um, after hearing Allison's story, I, I can't imagine how you cannot possibly know it's going to help because it sounds like you needed some serious stress release. Yeah. <laughs> that must have been, oh, I just, I am going to be gobsmacked the rest of the day. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Good thing well, it's afternoon. I'm, well, thank you. And th thank you so much for um, allowing me to come on and tell the story. I really, really am so grateful to you for that and for doing this show. Yay, you for getting thank the word you. out there and giving people a place to learn and to be a part of a community. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.